This week, a class about perceptions and remembrances of the victims of the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks with Professor Jonathan Marwell of the University of Michigan. The class discussion focuses on a photograph by Associated Press photographer Richard Drew of a man falling from the North Tower of the World Trade Center. What is so important, it seems, is that we identify this man. Was it Jonathan Briley? Okay, the second one who seems to be the man, or the first guy, Noberto. But is that important? Is identifying him by name as important as knowing him as an anonymous jumper faced with no alternative? More with Professor Jonathan Marwill in a moment. Okay, let's, uh, let's begin. You know, so far, what we have been um, focusing on, uh, first of all, was the film and the images in the Naudet film done by the two brothers, uh, the French brothers, uh, 9-11. So we've looked at, what, uh, images of the buildings and noticeably images of firefighters because they were the, the main focus of the film. And then last week, we started talking about the 9-11 Commission report. That is, how was the event investigated? And we're going to continue on with that on, fr- on Thursday of this week. What we haven't looked at and what you might think is, in some ways, not appropriate to look at are the dead. And the dead of this event, when you think about it, if you have thought about it very much, they're in a rather unusual position vis-a-vis the dead of other either terrorist attacks or attacks by political regimes or armies on populations, and that is they're not visible. We have no bodies. You think about it. Almost all the bodies in New York were incinerated. They took out parts of bodies afterwards, and one or two whole bodies they found, believe it or not, There are no bodies at Shanksville, Pennsylvania, and I have not seen pictures of the bodies injured as well as dead of the Pentagon, though I'm sure there are some pictures out there somewhere. But in New York, it's a grave site. Ground Zero is a grave site without any bodies. And what's so interesting is they're unseen The most obvious example of a dead person is this man, as yet not certainly identified, possibly identified, not certainly. He is on his way to death, as were some 200 to 300 more people. No one knows how many people jumped from the Twin Towers, most of them, by the way, from the North Tower, hit first, smoking while the South Tower was then struck and went down first. Okay, most of the jumpers were from the North Tower. And as I say, nobody knows exactly, estimates two to three hundred, but that represents roughly 10% of the people killed in the World Trade Center who chose to jump rather than suffocate, be burned to death, whatever. Uh, perhaps some accidentally fell or somehow fell, you know, they were somehow nudged, they didn't intend to jump. But most of the people, it seems, who were seen by onlookers, people who were there in the streets below, saw a lot of these people, it seemed that they jumped, that they made a deliberate. And in some cases, we know that people jumped together holding hands. These are not people being pushed, they decided to jump. And Lord knows one can understand why. Uh, uh, the death by suffocation or by fire, noticeably by fire, is terrible, terrible kind of death. Now, today, you were to have read the article by Tom Juneau, uh, published in Esquire, 2003, uh, about this particular photograph, which is a set of photographs, the man falling almost not all the way down, but 
the uh, uh, the photographer Richard Drew took snapped a bunch of pictures, and so we, he's in various positions. Um, Janot wrote this piece about this particular image and tried through investigation to identify who this man was. Very difficult to do when you think about it. Um, uh, in the piece, you may recall, he uses the phrase that this photo and others like it were iconic but not permissible. Now, this photo appeared on, I think, page 7 of the New York Times on September 12th. I remember seeing it. In fact, I have it in my office. I have that complete issue of September 12th, long before I knew I was going to teach a course like this. It never appeared again. It never appeared in the New Well, I should say it never. It appeared again in the New York Times book review in 2007. But it was also published uh, in other papers... It was seen on CBS and then immediately taken off the airwaves in the United States, did not appear in magazines. There was a kind of voluntary censorship, voluntary decision. It should not be seen. If you had picked up a European magazine or a newspaper in the days following September 11th, let alone the weeks, you would have seen this picture or others like it. The Europeans did not have any trouble, or were not troubled, I should say, at least publications, uh, were not troubled uh, printing this and other pictures. So I guess the, a good place to start with this situation or this issue of the dead is to look at this image and say or ask, what is impermissible? At the same time, if it's iconic, is there not a kind of contradiction that something that would be iconic, that would have the value of an icon, would be an icon not to be seen? Now, that's more than one question. Let's, let's start with perhaps the more immediate of the two. What's impermissible? Why should this not be allowed to be seen? You might want to think, by the way, or recall, remember what Jules Naudet says when he, he's going into the tower with the firemen in the North Tower, and he decides not to photograph a body at the, out of the doorway to the tower. This should not be seen, he says in the film. Maybe that would give you a a handle. But what do you just instinctively think is the problem with this being sort of a forbidden image, as if it were, you know, some sexual image that people are not allowed to see one time? Yeah. Um, Well, in the article, it kind of talks about, in my reaction as well, is that that person has a family and they would be severely hurt by seeing that if they recognized their family member, husband, father. If that person had a family, remember we don't know for sure who he is. It's a male, undoubtedly. That seems to be certain. But even the article goes from one possibility to another possibility but is not even sure of that. This could have been a bachelor. Okay. Do you think it's, but even if you assume that you know who it is, okay, should that have made it impermissible to be identified since the family and friends of the family and other family members know that person died that day? So would that make a difference even? Yeah. I think there's kind of a difference in the way that people perceive when someone dies by like, Somewhat like a, something un, that they can't help, whereas if they choose to commit suicide, even though it may have been so bad that they knew they had they weren't going to live, I still think like a family member would have, or anyone who knew them would have, I don't know, had a hard time coping with the fact that like this, they died by jumping out of the building rather than. 
Do you recall what the daughter of the first suspected, of the first person who was suspected to be this man, what the daughter said when she was interviewed by the journalist? It's quoted in the article. I don't remember the exact words, but it was something along the lines of, like, thank goodness he's not going to hell or something. Not quite, not quite. Because <laughs> I thought that they were like, it's a, it's a sin yeah. to try to... In, in the Catholic religion, suicide is a sin, Okay. That, that is, you know, you might wind up where you don't want to be. That, it's certainly true. Do you recall the words? Yeah. Um, she said, that piece of shit is not my father. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the mother doesn't want to think so either, though she's not as strikingly eloquent as her daughter uh, about the matter. And clearly, or seemingly clearly, they, it's not that they have a problem with, the man's death because they know he's probably dead, but that they don't want to believe that he would have committed suicide. That's what makes him that piece of shit, as the article says. Uh, we don't have to use the word again, but the point is, it's, it's, it's not the death itself. Uh, and are we, I mean, the point you raise, which I think is a, a quite a fair point, that Let's say he could be definitively identified. You know, if you were a family member of that person, would you really want to see that? Well, no, you probably would not. But we don't seem in America to have a problem with seeing dead bodies from wars or crimes or traffic accidents or fires. What do you think there's... What's the di- let me put it this way. What's the difference between a man actually not yet dead, he will be very soon, what's the difference between someone dead from September 11th as opposed to seeing a person dead from any number of other causes in this country that we seem not to have a problem with? Uh, and certainly, of course, movies show terrible images of the dead all the time. But let's, let's not even talk about... Uh, fictive media just talk about you know real life we are almost bombarded with images of the dead and badly injured I mean we're warned if you know sometimes TV programs will say you know disturbing images don't you know if you don't want to be disturbed don't watch the program but they show them yeah Um, I think when you're talking about war or an accident the dead body almost that was what happened and there wasn't another choice right when you go to war you're expected not expected but you take that risk because you're going to get shot there's going to be dead body and this these are normal everyday citizens who had no choice except to jump unless they want to suffocate to death so in a way we didn't with these people if you're looking as a family you don't expect them to be jumping from a building whereas if you go to war you almost expect that phone call one day Fair enough. Uh, would, would that argument then, so to speak, include why Jules Naudet does not want to photograph that person when he goes to the North Tower? The person's already dead, probably not identifiable easily, but he doesn't want, he doesn't want to do that. Go ahead. Well, we talked about with the Naudet brothers how he wasn't the normal photographer, so right. it struck him as something, he's almost like an everyday citizen seeing a dead body that someone just died. Whereas we talked about if his brother was there, he was a photographer and he probably, we can't say for sure, but he would have been more inclined he probably as would a have. photojournalist or as a cameraman to see that and to film it. Then the question is, do you think they would have included it in the film? Let's say he had shot it. Remember, they shot 175 hours uh, footage through the training of the firemen and the fire it's, and, and the buildings themselves. The question is, would they have included that image even if uh, Gideon had shot it and, and when Jules did not, would they have included it in the film? Or do you think there's something about the dead of September 11th that separates them out from other dead? Sir? Well, I don't think there's necessarily a difference between the dead of September 11th for example, we were able to see the image of Father Judge, who in yes. fact died on September 11th. But I think that there's something intimately personal about seeing someone in the act of dying as opposed to being dead already. 
to see the life in them being taken as opposed to like their in-person or inanimate body itself. There's something, you know, we can relate to them. There's more immediate empathy in seeing someone alive one moment and then dead the next. I think that's why the image of the falling man is so taboo because it's the immediate immediacy of his incoming death that we f find so troubling as opposed to, you know, the image of someone who's dead already. Do you think, I, I like the point, I think, I think we would all agree that's a, a good distinction to make. Do you think we would have trouble, because I've certainly seen such pictures, seeing someone jumping from the San Francisco Bay Bridge, Golden Gate Bridge, because I've certainly seen photographs of people jumping. Is that, is that different? I think that's different in a number of ways. One being that it's not as inherently violent the image of them, for example, perhaps crashing into the water would be less disturbing mm. than seeing the falling man hitting the ground. And then you have the fact that he's forced to jump, whereas someone who is jumping from... It's a voluntary act, yeah. ...voluntarily committing suicide. Yeah. I think there's something about the actual event of September 11th that it affected our whole country. So even if you're not a family member of someone who died, in 9-11 it still affected you and threat, like our whole nation felt more vulnerable. So I think kind of everyone is more sensitive about the issue, even if they weren't directly affected or one of their family members, just because like our whole nation was affected. So everyone is more sensitive. We felt more vulnerable. Is, is somehow that, that sense of vulnerability we, we felt, which certainly was part of the experience of that day and lingered on for many days thereafter, as the country worried about, is there going to be another attack? Everybody thought there would be. Uh, I was telling another class this morning there's something very interesting about the days following September 11th uh, in 2001 and the days following December 7th, 1941. Uh, and that is that if you really read in the literature, go back and check it out, you realize that everybody expected that the next stop of the Japanese was California. They weren't going to stop in Hawaii. They were coming. And, and people were very on edge that that was not, the, that was not the, the event itself, and it was finished with Pearl Harbor. And the same thing, I think, was true. I know it was true after September 11th. The next few days, everybody said, you know, is there another city, another set of planes coming, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that sense of vulnerability. Uh, let's, let's hold on to that, but there were some more hands. Yeah. I think it it separates itself from other pictures that would, could be similar to this, like someone jumping off of a bridge, because this was a result of an act of terror as opposed to just an, like something everyday life, like a car accident or something like that. So this man was forced to make the decision to take his own life because of the terrorist attack. Fair enough. I mean, that, I I think that that says it. That ex explains or offers an explanation that it was an act of terror. But I wonder if, in fact, that is really the reason why we don't want to see it, that, that we know that the immediate cause is the burning building and that that was created by an act of terror. I wonder if that really is what is disturbing us about it. Yeah, I think just going along on that on that note, I mean, as opposed to other people, maybe even someone also jumping from a building. Um, I think people pair that image when they see it with other images that they've seen from the day and other ideas they have from the day. I mean, so if you think if you take that image for say, and for me personally, like I when I see that, I, I'm picturing in my mind also the burning building and the, the plane hitting the building. And I think pairing that all together kind of makes it seem a lot worse maybe than than the still image itself. Because if you just look at it, it's not such a Oh, I'm going to cringe at that image. Like I can't look at it. So, like the the what the the response it evokes from from your mind isn't. Uh, let me let me just be provocative, because I agree with you. There's some the image is 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 yes. You're aware that that man is hurtling to his death. You can't escape that. But but what drew drew the photographer's attention in part is the geometry. I mean, there's something aesthetically quite intriguing about the geometry of that building, the lines, the, vertical, the verticality of the entire image, 
the body going down. And by the way, that's the most commonly, that was the image chosen by the Times, where he's in vertical flow with the building. Because on Drew's, you know, the other images, he's in a different position. And none of them is quite as vertical. And in fact, a couple of them, he's sort of flailing around, as you might expect. And, but this one, it's all, there's something, I don't want to say peaceful, that would be going too far, but he's not struggling. It's as if he, was, he dove down into the earth by his own choice, and he just happened to line up with the building. Uh, that is, there's something aesthetically right, however grotesque the overall setting is for this moment happening. Yeah, Anna. I think the disturbing part is that he does look graceful. You know, mm-hmm. They're not going to pick a photo where he's flailing or he looks like he's in pain and is struggling. They're going to pick a photo where it feels like you're watching a man take the last few moments of his life, you know, escape this burning, chaotic, smoke-filled terror above him and just take the last few moments of clean air. I think that's the most disturbing part is because we don't think about taking that choice in our everyday lives. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Graceful, yes, I like that word too. And... and and clearly the choice, I mean, it's not a choice that uh, any of us would ever choose to be confronted with, though when you think about it, many people are. Uh, uh, people facing their own death. Maybe one of you has a grandparent or somebody uh, very, very ill with something or other, and the doctor says, well, I can do another operation, I'll give you three more weeks. And the grandparent says, uh uh-uh. uh, I've had enough of it. Anybody have that experience with not wanting to? Well, I did with my mother when she was very ill. The doctor said, Oh, yeah, we can operate again. And all they could promise her was, you know, a couple more months and not very pleasant months. So she just chose to die. So it's that the choosing of death in a certain manner, she didn't have to jump from a building, obviously, to die. The choosing of death over continually, li- continually living is not altogether unusual yeah um i think part of the reason that it's like so taboo and emotional is because like it's the really the only picture that that makes any connection with like how awful the people Mm. in the building were struggling like you see the burning building you see the plane crashing in and you just think like this is terrible this is like a horrible thing that happened but then when you think about the fact that some that people made the conscious decision to jump out of a building that like really brings you face to face with how much they suffered inside of that building or maybe they hadn't suffered but knew they were going to yeah there's no evidence that this man has been on fire right it just it makes them more like real people to you to like rather than i don't know it just draws a deeper connection I well think. i i i I think you've made a very fair point. Yeah, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, and just to go along with that, it's not that it's not that that's just the only picture of people inside. That's like the only picture of victims usually that you'll see at all. Yes, I mean we don't have very much. That's this that's is not a guy that is surrounded by burning oil, jet fuel, and metal. This is a guy in a very clean, open, free space. There's nothing inhibiting what you see is about to happen, and you kind of have to accept it. It's the only connection you have. Well, that leads, doesn't it, in a a certain way to moving from the impermissible to the iconic. An iconic image. I mean, first, I don't even want to get to the contradiction between being iconic and impermissible. Let's just talk about, if I said to you, if I'd start out today by saying, and Juno is not the only one to have said such a thing, that this image really is iconic of September 11th, at least in New York. This is the image that really establishes what September 11th is all about. That's what an icon is. This is something we really heed. Do you think, do you think that's true? Now, that's separate. They're connected finally, but that's separate f- from saying it's impermissible. You think if somebody wanted to say, give me an image of 9-11, you might say, well, there it is. There is the standard image. Is that iconic, though? Does that rise to a certain level of ultimately getting at the truth? 
which is what I can't stand for, ultimately getting at the truth of what September 11th was. And of course, that and many, in a, many images like it were the images we were constantly bombarded with that day and have since ever, been ever since. Um, yeah. I don't think it should be the iconic image because I think it's more of an image of, a, of destruction. You this know? one you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. You see images like of buildings collapsing even if someone purposely, obviously not in an act of terror, but if a building had to come down, mm -hmm. you see pictures like that. But you don't see the human aspect of it. When most people look at that picture, they probably don't think about the people who are inside. Whereas when you look at the picture of the falling man, it puts a very human face on September 11th. It makes you think more of the victims, which I think is what it should be. Well, when we see that, do we, do you think we imagine the people inside with that image? Do you, you know, if you can, you were very young then, obviously, but when you saw all those pictures that day, you know, running on TV and the next day and the next day, did they set off your mind imagining what people inside must have felt? Or was the picture itself, the horribleness, and, then of the, and the pictures of the buildings falling, that your imagination just stayed there with the buildings? They, your imagination didn't travel inside. This picture, you can't help, let me submit, you can't help but be imagining in looking at it of what is about to happen to him. And is that what is terrible about that picture? Because you, you, you are in your mind's eye, you see it coming, the, the, what, within a matter of seconds, what's going to be of him. Whereas you can never quite grasp the people inside because you can't see it. It's left only in your imagination and therefore not as powerful or more powerful. What do you think? I think for me... The fact that I was in fifth grade when it happened, I'd never been to New York at that point. I'd seen pictures of the towers before, but I've never been inside. So I couldn't draw that. I mean, I, we thought about the people when we were sitting in class in elementary school watching it on TV, but we didn't, we didn't have any idea what it looked like inside. So for us, it was that iconic image of the tower being hit, and then also later on after the fact it the the lasting i think image was every september 11th when they anniversary they did those uh, beacons of light that went up in yes. the new york skyline and i think that was the other lasting image that i have from the tower perspective not even talking about the pentagon well when you were in the fifth grade you were what 10 11 10 11 yeah. okay uh do you recall was it that kind of picture that is towers being struck or both of them burning, that, so to speak, shocked slash impressed you, or the buildings, one and then the other, coming down? For me, it was the second tower being, I, we saw the plane flying towards it, and to me, it's that image. It wasn't, I mean, the towers coming down, it was terrible, but we... I don't know. For me, it was the plane right before it struck. Okay. The okay. okay. Uh, but let's go back to the falling man or the jumper. Uh, more thoughts on what makes this iconic? What makes this so, so what, important? First here and then over there. People could argue that it's iconic because of its uniqueness. I think that most people, if you said September 11th, would probably associate the other image or some sort of image of the towers being hit or on fire with that day. But because it's so unique, it, it, it kind of brings something different to the table. And it's not an image that a lot of people capture. I mean, there's a lot of views and a lot of shots of the towers getting hit and being on fire. But that's like the, on, the only picture that's been published that's of a man jumping from the building. Before we go over here, you remind me of something, and I want to bring it up and ask you. Richard Drew, the photographer. Um, in 1968, in June of 1968, uh, what was it, about June 4th or 5th, 
He was in Los Angeles when Bobby Kennedy was giving a speech at a hotel. And that was the night that after Kennedy finished his speech and went down, he was going through the kitchen to go out to the car that was going to take him away from giving the speech. And he, he probably had the Democratic nomination wrapped up at that point, okay? He was shot and killed. And Drew was one of the photographers there and took a picture, which has been seen many times, of the dead or dying Bobby Kennedy lying on the floor in the kitchen of this hotel. That was printed, has been printed many times. How do you, how do you, how do you, how do you compare that in terms of the, the, the shock? And by the way, that image is about the only image of Kennedy lying on the floor. No, there were a couple of other photographers there. They might have taken a very similar image, but no one, no one got it in the act of shooting per se, as I recall. But it's the image on the floor of the dead or near dead Kennedy. Uh, is that is that an impermissible image to be to be revealed constantly? Uh, I don't know. I guess, but I think that because of the context and. Yeah. The response that the, the day itself of September evokes. Because, I mean, just looking at that picture with no context, it, you don't know how, how high he jumped from. You don't know much about it. But knowing that it is related to that event, I think, is what makes it so much worse in the minds of a lot of people. Interestingly, people have argued, I'm not suggesting rightly or wrongly, because historians are only prophets of the past, not of the future, but have argued that that was a significant turning point those shots in the history of America, that if Kennedy had not been shot and the election had gone on, he would have won over Nixon. And the history of the United States would have been different. In fact, some would argue that his death at that time was more pivotal in terms of changing or not changing things than his brother's death in 1963. But you can read about that and decide for yourself. Yeah, you had something you want to... Yes, uh, so... About this picture, I think, at least for me, there are a lot of parallels parallels that you can draw from this man falling in the Twin Towers. And I think the one that pretty much stands out in my mind that I can relive the image of was seeing the buildings actually fall. You know, And then here you can see this man sort of falling. And we can, yes, we can build an emotional connection to it. But you know, I will pose a question here, and then I'll try to answer it, is if the buildings didn't fall, would this picture still be sort of iconic because I can draw parallels between a man falling, the falling man, and the two towers coming down, falling, and therefore making it more, that much more sort of significant, sort of in my, in my mind, if I'm seeing this photo as being truly iconic, an event of 9-11. Well, what, what, I think you've raised a wonderful question. What, and I don't know exactly the time of this, but I think it is before the South Tower actually came down uh what if they hadn't come down would this picture be as disturbing forget about the iconic part now would this be as disturbing to us if the buildings had not fallen the fires had gone on probably similar number of people would have been dead because i pointed out to you it's been pretty well established that most of the people who died in the twin towers were at the floor of each individual tower where the floors where the plane struck or above, that the overwhelming number of people below those floors got out under their own steam, walked out, so to speak. So, you know, what's the impact if the towers don't fall? I think it's a wonderful way of, of reframing the question in terms of trying to find the sense of this fi- picture, what, what it means to us and why we are so disturbed by it. Yeah. Hadn't fallen, it becomes more, more disturbing on a personal level because in this image, knowing that the towers did come down, you kind of see him coming down with the towers in a mm-hmm. sense. But had they not come down, that, that issue of suicide and him choosing to take his own life and jumping becomes that much more real because <coughs> at the, in that matter, he's not coming down with the building. Okay. Any, any other thoughts on that? Yeah. I think if the towers had not come down, it would be less disturbing because the, with the fact that the towers did come down he becomes all the more important he embodies all of those dead you know who perished mm-hmm. in the towers that we never got to see 
the author relates uh, this image to the tomb of the unknown soldier, to all those soldiers that we not, yes. not get to see perish who did not know how. And we have, no, we have no real remains to speak of. I think that brings back to Ken, the picture of Kennedy's death in that, you know, the uniqueness of Kennedy as an individual, as a national figure, uh, distinguishes him from the falling man because the falling man is everyone. He is everyone who died, and the fact that he's also still alive. You know, it makes that point. Yeah, we can we p can put ourselves in his shoes, mm -hmm. and you know, then therefore put ourselves in the shoes of everyone who's in the towers. Okay. Does that? Having said that, okay. Is there a level at which this picture disturbs us that has less to do with, well, I don't want to say less. Let's just say that disturbs us both because it's September 11th but independent of that. Now, it's already been indicated, uh, uh, one student indicated that somehow you know, this is maybe all of us at some point, but all of us wouldn't mind our pictures taken at, at whenever that point might be, but that this particular representation of that point of having to make a choice about life or death uh, is a point at which we're very uncomfortable in our own skins with this phenomenon. That is that this picture has. This is a let me let me let me try to put this in a in a in a clearer way. That there is something threatening about this photo. To us. And we may not even be able to articulate what it is, but it's disturbing us is is because in some way or ways it threatened us. Yeah. I think like adding to that like such a personal decision that he made. I mean, that I feel like we can understand, but that it was taken, like, that people photographed it, that it became the image, like, he didn't have a choice in that matter. He didn't, you know, he couldn't have known. Well, but he did have a choice, didn't he? I mean, yeah. Did he? Yeah. I don't think he could have known any, like, that it, his death, his, like, personal choice yeah. would become such a public sign. Yeah. Do you, uh, since the word has been used now, and it's certainly part of the inquiry by Junod, do you, do you think that this was suicide? Uh, your, un, your understanding of suicide? No, because, I mean, it's, it's clear, I think, to everyone that there were two choices and both of them were death. He just chose to control his own. Family. Does anybody want to see that any differently? Yeah. I think it's almost a sign of, like, the last hope, you know, if... If you're there and you look and you see there's fire and smoke and there's people dying around you, there's an open window, you know there are firefighters there. Like, I remember always wondering why they didn't have those giant uh, trampolines there to try to catch people if mm -hmm. they were falling. I think it's that like those last few moments, that last hope that maybe if I jump, there will be something down there to catch me. Okay. Yeah. Well, just going back to your question about what's so threatening about it. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if this is what you're looking at, but... Uh, I'm not... I, I don't have an opinion about uh, any of this. The, man, of this. the falling man is kind of like a business... As some sort of businessman. And the Twin Towers represented, like, modernity in some sense of, like, you know, advancement of Western e economies and stuff. And that was crashing down, and the businessman is crashing down, so it's kind of threatening to everyone, so Americans in general about... So you think, oh, so, so we sort of translate this into a metaphor, a metaphor of uh, this, this, this image, of metaphor of the larger American uh, destructive act that this attack represents. Okay? Uh, any other thoughts on this? Yeah, in the back. I think maybe this picture could be seen as threatening because in a certain way this man's perceived mindset from what you think he chose to do uh, goes against possibly a collective anger that people have um, instead of you know choosing to almost be defiant and stay in the building uh, and wait for hope he quit he completely resigned mm -hmm. at least that's what I mean the image seems to show and that might conflict with what a lot of people were feeling at the time uh, on a national level on uh, a foreign policy level even 
So I think that might have might have upset some people, perhaps. Yeah. It's interesting that his wife, we already had the quote about the daughter. Uh, his wife, if you may recall from the article, she says that she wants, quote, to clear my husband's name, meaning that she doesn't want it to be him because that would mean he committed suicide and being a good Catholic, he shouldn't do that. So she clearly interpreted it or perhaps just thought the local priest or the church was going to interpret it as so suicide. But do all of you agree with what was said over here? It's clearly not suicide. It's a choice between two deaths, and how can that be suicide? Or does anybody want to? Yes, ma'am. I don't think it's suicide because <coughs> I think this person that day, those people in the top like levels of the tower yeah. had their choice of life or death taken from them. They knew they were going to die, and that man chose freedom. He wanted the choice to choose how he was going to die, and maybe it is that symbol of hope that maybe he'd survive somehow, but it was like a last chance at freedom. Like, I don't want to die because terrorists hit, destroyed my building. Yeah. I want to die the way I choose. You know, unfortunately, we, we, we don't know what was in his head, and we could construct, you know, any scenario for what he was thinking. He might be saved. The fireman might have some kind of super mat. Or it was just a choice between two deaths, one less hideous than the other. Uh, or who knows? But we, do, we don't know. To turn, but not turn entirely away from this, to the other, other piece that I had you read for today. Uh, the excerpt, very small excerpt, from this volume called Portraits, which was published in 2002 and is a compilation of the some 1900, um, I guess you call them portraits. You might also call them obituaries, but the Times didn't like that. The New York Times, starting in the fall, as you read in the introduction, starting in the fall of 2001, after September 11th, uh, decided to investigate, inquire into who all these people were that died in the Twin Towers, or as many as possible. And finally, what, over 130 reporters worked on this. Reporters from every possible field in the Times spent some time making phone calls, looking up public records, whatever else they could find, to come up with a short statement. These range from five to ten sentences. They're not, none of them are very long. I've, I've looked through the whole book. And I just Xeroxed a couple of pages out. I want to say totally randomly, but not quite randomly. Um, and in the, um, in the foreword, they use the statement. They say that these are not really typical obituaries. And that... They, there is something consoling about these statements. And at another point, there, they, these, these people, the statements made about them, suggest, quote, the subtle nobility of everyday existence. And so with that sort of the lead-in, let me turn and read to you, for those who didn't bring your thing today, I want to read the one that determined which pages I would choose to show you. I said more or less randomly, not entirely randomly. And this is the one on Josh Rosenthal, a man and a sister grow up. And of course, like the others, it's short. Last Sunday night, Josh Rosenthal went out for dinner with his sister Helen and her family to celebrate the coming of fall and the fact that they were all together again after being apart over the summer. He had just picked up Catcher in the Rye, she said, and he was just adorable about the relationship between Holden and his sister. A portfolio, that's end of quote, a portfolio manager at Fiduciary Trust, Mr. Rosenthal most liked to, quote, play with his nieces, but of course I would say that, Ms. Rosenthal said, that's his sister, he would tease them mercilessly, just like he would tease me when I was a little girl. 
He would also bring them gifts from his many travels, like a stamp with their names in Japanese or beautiful Chinese robes. Ms. Rosenthal, the sister, who described her only sibling as her best friend, said that the two had been especially close since a two-month trip they took together through Southeast Asia about 15 years ago, where they discovered each other as adults. He wasn't teasing me anymore, she said. End of. Now, is that an obituary? Clearly not, right? You don't know who this guy is, except he's a portfolio manager and he's got a sister who loved him. What, and they're all like this, in one form or another, the half dozen others that you read, just they each have another different spin, but they're all like this. And as I say in the introduction, they're referred to as being consoling. What, what do you think that word means? And how does it apply to these, to these uh, portraits of the dead? Now, we've been talking about the dead in one context today. I'm now shifting your attention to how the dead are going to be remembered, at least in this first, you know, kind of exposure of them to memory in the form of these portraits. Yeah. Um, well, I think this one in particular, it's, it's like, it's more focused on the sister and like her emotions towards Josh rather than him as a person. And it's almost as though she's like remembering him in a way that she can like let go of him and emotionally cope with what had happened to him. Oh, and that's very well said. Yeah. So what happens to Josh in this, therefore? What's the, what's, the, what's the fallout to Josh if, if this is really about his sister? I guess he becomes remembered as his sister remembers him. Okay, he, okay. It's not, yeah, it's just not really about like, him as a person. Well, I don't know how far we want to go with that. I mean, there is, you do get a sense of him, even though you might get a sense of the sister's affect more. Was there a hand over here? Yeah. Um, I think, building on what she said, it's, it's as his sister remembered him, but it's not... These portraits aren't painted for me to remember as a victim of September 11th. You don't want to think of them as someone who died on that day. A lot of these portraits are thinking about the person as they were, kind of almost like a, an obituary, except not talking about they were in the Twin Tower, they were in the plane, things well, like that. Well, the book, you know, everybody there is, was there. Yeah. Was there, but I think if you just look at it, right, because if you're looking at one of them and just with no context, it's not talking about, oh, they were a victim, but it was talking about their life, and you don't, I don't picture it when I was reading them. I don't connect it. Wow, what a great life. Too bad they died in the Twin Tower. I think of it as more of a celebration or of their personality. And I, I don't think it's nice that they don't talk about how they died in an act of terror. Okay. Yeah. Well, I just think reading through this that it did a really great job of showing the human value that we lost that day. It wasn't just a number. It wasn't a, a, just an attack on, on uh, these buildings falling down. It wasn't an attack on our economy, on our system. It was, it was, an, uh, it was uh, more about the people in the building and what they represented. Uh, they were just average people. And to go and get this little snippet of their lives and bring it out, I think, what is a really a much better way to remember them. Like she said, removing the stigma of, of this person died on September 11th, kind of, it, it, it doesn't give good uh, credence to what they really stood for. And it, it's not the best way, I think, to remember them. And I think do, you, do you ever read obituaries? I, I, I have a few in the past few years. Here. Yeah. Um, do, how, would you, how would you distinguish then between the kind of obituaries you've read and this one? I mean, I take your point about, mm -hmm. but I'm just curious then, what's the difference between this in your, the way you would articulate it and the standard obituary? I think the standard obituary is just much more, much more broad. It starts at, they usually start at the beginning and go through different phases in a person's life. And well, the short obituary, right. not the long one for right. presidents, the short one for the, you know, the just, grocer down yeah. the street. Through a few paragraphs or something. I think yeah. what these uh, sought to do is focus on one, one moment and just bring that one moment mm -hmm. and embody one, uh, the person, each person, in that one moment. And I think that it, it, it shows how each story, kind of, that person's going to be remembered by that moment. And what kind, I think you're absolutely right that that's what they do. What kind of moment is it that is consistent in all of these? Can you, can you tease out what kind of moment the editors were looking for in these pieces? Because obviously the reporters investigated, 
they wrote up, they gave their, they gave their write up to the editor and the editor said, yeah, that's great. Or he said, or she said, no, go back and let's reframe that differently. What is it that each of these is, is, is consistently trying to do, even though they're very different lives, people from different you know, backgrounds, different occupations. You're left, I think, with something very important that is perhaps suggested in that statement where I just read it, the nobility of daily existence. What is it uh, that you are left with, first and second? Yeah. I think it, it's not so much a defining moment in their life as much as how their families and friends would remember them or just one single moment that someone would find memorable. It might not... <laughs> what would make it memorable? What, what, what gave it memorability, if you will? I, I think in this one, it's kind of just remembering a personal moment with their sibling that okay. kind of maybe when they grew up or when they moved on or when they just learned something about the other person. I know the one prior to that, you know, when mm-hmm. the little girl said, oh, he's a keeper. Yes. You know, it might not be the defining moment of the relationship as a whole, but it's something that the family is going to hold on to forever. Did you believe that the little girl actually used that expression? Uh, they were fishing, so I, I think I'd believe it. Okay. I've got a bridge in Brooklyn for you, though. Here you go. <laughs> yeah, uh... So, yeah, going on sort of similar to his point, um, I think they try to uh, portray the, uh, the victim's sort of, like, voice, you know, character. They use yeah, like, dialogue. sure enough, yeah. They, uh, you know, there's a certain, like, quote here with uh, Richard's one. He, he had a devilish grin on his face because he knew I was scared. She said, you know, it was more bringing more of a sort of a personal feel into their lives, like a little segment, you know. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't so much as um, giving them sort of, descriptions on how he was, but more like bringing in dialogue between the family members and saying like, you know, here's how we see him and view him. And I think there was a unique, unique way of writing about each of the uh, victims here. So, Any other thoughts on a common denominator in these things? Uh, I would consider love to be the common element in the okay. They mention uh, acts of kindness, expressions of love. Yeah. And you see that Every story is uh, ultimately positive, whether it's hosting barbecues for your neighborhood, getting married, moving to New York to live with a loved one. Every story is about the love that these individuals who died had for those around them. I think that's a very good point. And would you add the word value to that? That each of these was a person of value, if only to other people. They weren't necessarily valuable to the nation. Yeah, but it went out of the way to show the connections that these people had to those around them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, other, yeah. I like that they show the normalcy of their lives. Yes, yeah, the everyday existence, so to speak. It's just yes. every day. So they went on a fishing trip over the weekend. He was mm-hmm. out to dinner with a family. These are just normal things that happen every day. The nobility day. of everyday existence. Right. Yeah, yeah, no, I think, I think, and it's, it's well done. I mean, I've read many more than this one. Yeah. I think, uh, in a sense, by, by talking about so many people that, that these people touched in their lives or that they had an effect on, I think it kind of makes it seem like there was almost more <coughs> victims than just the, the number of deaths. I mean, the more people were affected by this and victimized by this event than just, like, oh, a number of 3,000. I mean, it, all the, these people's death also had an effect on so many people down the line, and it was felt more than just by the 2,000, 3,000 deaths. Would that, though, have been achieved if they had just published the kind of straightforward obituary? So, for example, let's take Rosenthal. Uh, Josh Rosenthal uh, was, what, 41, 42. He had graduated from the University of Michigan in 1979. He went to New York. He got into what he got into, and he left, a, he left a loving sister, Helen. Okay, your standard obituary, because he hadn't done anything famous. He was just a businessman. Would, would, would that not have achieved the same thing as you're trying to say? I mean, in, in, to some people, maybe. I think, okay. I think that that just kind of makes it seem just so standard, and it's just like, okay, here it is. This is what needs to be written. This is the... How many of those would you have wanted to read? <laughs> not. And, and yeah. this kind of makes it so personal. It makes you yeah. feel for those actual connections that they had, not just, I mean, there are a lot of people that maybe aren't so close with a family member or this or that. Or, I mean, it makes it see the, the, the positive light in all of it and, like, how much of an effect they actually had on these people. 
that were a part of their lives. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, I think that also because there were so many people that died that day, in the same way, there, there needed to be some way to write these obituaries or pieces about them that would make them stand out and not just make them like one of the masses that died in September 11th. So I think that's why they approached it in such a non-typical obituary way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Each of these individuals is given a real identity, not, not an identity of statistics, when they were born, where they went to school kind of thing, but an identity as a kind of human being. And when you think about that word identity, and then you come back to this and that, and the question is, the loss of identity in the actual destruction of the Twin Towers, the fact that nobody, nothing virtually was recovered. It is, it is a death site without bodies. Okay. And what does it mean that in the aftermath, there is this quest, if you will, a desire to give these people identity, just as the reporter for this. So what is so important, what is so important, it seems, is that we identify this man. Was it Jonathan Briley, okay, the second one who seems to be the man, or the first guy, Noberto? But is that important? Is identifying him by name as important as knowing him as an anonymous jumper faced with no alternative is that which is the more important thing to know about this figure who he was or what he faced is his actual identity as a human being significant to anybody else but his family but is his is so to speak the identification of him as a victim precisely like virtually all the others with no chance is that what should matter heavy question heavy qu- any anybody want to lighten it up in some way and give a, a thought to this yeah yeah uh, but i think that's a really tough question to sort of <coughs> answer um i think from a societal viewpoint and in the context of the event then his identity is actually what we can see here, this unknown man jumping from a building and what we can put in the context of 9-11. I think what we want to strive for is to actually see him as a person without the context of 9-11. I think that's what we all want to sort of eventually strive for is to see this man without him being sort of this free falling like, jumper out of a, out of a building. You know, so, I don't know, like, when I first saw the picture, my mind immediately went to, I didn't see him as, you know, whether he had background, family, who his name was, or his profession. I just saw him as this sort of iconic photo of a man jumping out of a building and what mm-hmm. he had to face. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. eventually I want to get to a point where I can see him not as this jumper, but as someone else, like someone, like, I don't know, Jonathan Rosenblum. In this, uh, in this piece. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that <clears throat> a lot, of, a lot of it has to do with all, all these bodies were just jumbled under this massive heap of debris, mm-hmm. and a lot of the bodies were never even found. So the families were kind of looking for something concrete to hold on to for that person, and other people, they were fi- they were faceless bodies, <coughs> and then the portraits kind of give them that something to identify, you know, and relate to like the loss of life that happened. Do you think... um, As I say, in the the foreword, uh, these these portraits are presumably intended to be consoling, okay? 
And I take it from the things that have been said thus far that most of you would agree with that. Reading these is not difficult, that there is something humanly, you know, attractive about each of these such and that yes you know they're dead but the way in which they're described they're living on, on the page for you but does that you think and I'm only posing this I'm not in any way you know suggesting I think so and I want to see if you think so I'm only posing this do you think in some way that that is a problem for coming to terms with what happened on September 11th that we have managed to turn all the victims into really nice people. You know, each having their own nobility as a human being. And that by doing that, we may have been, what, uh, trying to distance ourselves from the actual horror of that day trying to make it a little less difficult to accept actually what happened, what it means to have happened, even why it happened, that we are um, sheltering ourselves. One, two. Uh, Well, I'm not sure... I know you might not be going after anything specific. But I'm not going after way, anything. I'm just asking a question. The way I see it is when we look at this, it's more disturbing because we don't know who that is. And as the end of the article says, um, the fact that we have known who the falling man is all along, that that could be any one of us or could be any person. But when you look at these, uh, these portraits and we make these into real people, it's somewhat comforting in the fact that, oh, that's, that's not me. Like, mm-hmm. I know that's not mm-hmm. me. I know that's, mm-hmm. well, I know that's not somebody that I know. It's not, I'm not dead. Somebody that I know isn't dead. This is somebody completely different. I've never heard of them or known them. Uh, but that guy, that could be anybody, and that's the scariest part about it. Well, but keep in mind, when I, when I raise that, and I'll let you speak in a second, when I raise this question about sheltering ourselves, remember, only seen once. We, didn't, we weren't allowed. We didn't want to. Because the reason why the magazines and newspapers and the TV stations took it, up, took it off is because they got flooded by phone calls. Don't show that. You shouldn't show that. That's too terrible to show. You know, it wasn't some boss who just decided, oh, I don't like that picture. Let's not use it again. It was public pressure not to show. And they have not ever since, really. I said 2007, the Times used it in a book review. But it's, it's still something that's sort of an, in the forbidden zone. And so is trying to console us with the obituaries and trying to mask us from the horror of really the choices to be made that day, do those two things, do those two efforts, so to speak, consolidate into a way in which at some level we don't want to he- witness September 11 in its full Horror. That's the question I'm trying to raise. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, like, while they're comforting, I think that it makes you witness September 11th in a way that you never did before. Okay, so good. Let's hear. Are, I mean, like, who wants to read about someone who's 28 years old, a week away from his wedding, whose fiance worked with him and could have been there that day, and is leaving behind not only her, but, like, five years old? A five-year-old kid. Yeah. Like, the... The idea of people dying on September 11th is tragic, undoubtedly. But when you put it on such an individual level, like, each loss, to me at least, feels more of, like, <coughs> it has so much more impact when you realize, like, who else was affected by it. And like he had mentioned previously, it's not just about the 3,000 victims who passed away, but everyone who, you know, was significantly affected by their loss as well. Okay, we have only a couple of minutes, and I, I wanted to fill you in on a rather intriguing aspect of this Rosenthal. Does anybody know who he was, aside from what you read there? Okay, uh, I, didn't, I didn't think you would. He was a graduate of the University of Michigan. His mother, Marilyn Rosenthal, taught at Dearborn. And... 
After, after his death, his mother, who was a medical sociologist, she wrote a lot. She was not a physician herself, and, but she taught at Dearborn in the sociology department, and I think she also had an appointment here in the medical school. She decided that she was going to uh, put aside the, uh, her actual academic field, and she spent the next five years of her life writing a book, researching and writing a book on the pilot of the plane that smashed into the South Tower where he was. And she went to the Middle East to interview his mother, okay, and family for this book. Uh... But she died in the summer of uh, 2007 before she finished it because I had gotten her, I knew her, uh, I had gotten her to agree to come in and talk to the the class the first time I taught it, which was in the fall of 2007. She was going to come in and talk about what it meant, the mother of a victim trying to talk to the family of the perpetrator or one of the perpetrators. And and what did she not simply have to overcome (coughs) in dealing with these people, but overcoming her own self and her own psyche to pursue this as an effort. Um, And the book was not finished, and I don't know that it's going to be finished, but uh, she was uh, responsible, not responsible in the sense of funding, but... uh, There is now every fall, in fact, it was just, I think, about 10 days ago, there is a Josh Rosenthal lecture here at the university named after him. And if you go down to Gallup Park on the river, there's a lovely wooden bench dedicated to him that was funded by friends of the family. Uh, And he is the most famous... um, victim of 9-11 with an association with the university. But if you go to Alumni Hall, which, you know, is just, uh, you know, go up the Diag and turn right, there is a plaque on the wall of the, I think it's 11 or 12 University of Michigan alumni who were killed on September 11th in alphabetical order, and I think the year of the class that they graduated in. So Michigan has a certain attachment, but the Rosenthal is, is the only one of them that has sort of emerged uh, his name, you know, connected with events here at the university. Um, so I think that will do it for the day. I thank you very much. This was good, good. I know it's a little troubling to talk about death in these matters, but I think it is something that deserves some discussion. Thanks. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. Be sure to check out our Book Notes Plus podcast. This week, a selection of calls into C-SPAN from September 12, 2001, the day after the terrorist attacks. They include eyewitness accounts to the attacks in New York City. <laughs>